Okay, we're going to get started. I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we all, uh, I'll tell you what kind of my ideas and thoughts are as this goes. You might want to sit closer, because I think some of these slides are a tad bit smaller, but up to you. Um, so Father, thank you again for this time, for this meeting, Lord. May uh, this prophecy update bless you, Lord. May you give us an urgency for evangelism. May we... Uh, Use it as a way to detach from this world, Lord, and see what's far more important, Lord, your kingdom coming. So may you show that. May it be evident here today. Um, May it give us excited anticipation for your return. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so our agenda topics. I have nine, why we look at prophecy, the rapture of the church, and kind of CCMC's eschatological view, I can barely say that word. Really, it's Calvary Chapel's views in general. Uh, Gog and Magog, rumors of war, pestilence, famine, immorality, one world government, antichrist, one world religion, apostasy, one currency, mark of the beast, Israel and the third temple, and I want to finish always with hope. Um, After each section, if you guys have a question, go ahead and you can ask as we get to the end. Because... if you're like me, like once that topic's over with, it's out of my mind. So I'd like to stay consistent. But if you ask a question during the, that topic, you will be probably recorded. So just so you know, if, if not, when we're done, we'll shut the recordings down and we can ask questions after that. But if it's pertaining to the topic we're at, uh, feel free to flag me down or whatever and we'll, we'll talk about why. Of course, this is not exhaustive. There are many topics I'm not going to address. I didn't even get to, I don't really touch on pestilence, which I have in here. Um, earthquakes and that kind of, I, I just didn't, ran out of time for so much stuff. So, and I thought it was important to talk about why we look at prophecy. First uh, Thessalonians says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. So prophecy is actually to bring us comfort. It should not give us, um, we shouldn't be nervous about it or, or nerve wracked about it. No, it should actually give us comfort. Uh, Matthew 6, 2 through 3 says, he answered them and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather for today, for the sky is red. Threatening hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. So Jesus kind of commanded to understand, to know the signs of the times you're in. Uh, two-thirds of the Bible prophecy, uh, the Bible is prophecy. I have down there at the bottom. So if we're students of the Bible, then we are also students of prophecy. Um, there's more written about end times than any other t- other period, and then uh, I got this quote, um, and I highly recommend this book if you have a lot of questions about prophecy, if you want to understand uh, how other people believe, it's the popular encyclopedia of Bible prophecy, really good book, it's literally like an encyclopedia, uh, if you want to know different views with all tribulation and uh, millennial kingdom and stuffing like, stuff like that, um, I said stuffing like it's Thanksgiving still in my head, food. Um, but this is what Tim LaHaye and Ed Hitchens said. Nothing motivates Christians like the study of prophecy. It puts an evangelistic fire in the heart of the church. It gives believers a vision for world missions, and it injects a desire to live a holy life in the age of unholiness. And that's our hope today as we look at Bible prophecy, though. So that's why we look at it, and then the Calvary Chapel's stance, our stance is the rapture of the church. We are pre-tribulation, pre-millennialist, and I'll get to what that means exactly, and where we get the rapture of the church is uh, first, among other places, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. The Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's our word. Together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with him, with the Lord. And that word caught up is harpazo in in the Greek. Uh, If you translate that to Latin, it's like raptura or whatever. So that's where we get our term rapture. So if anybody ever tells you that rapture is not in the Bible, you can say, well, if you read Latin, it is, which nobody reads Latin, but it's there. The the idea is there. Um, 1 Corinthians also 1551 for 53, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, 
And we shall be changed, for this corruption, corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. Titus 2.13, looking for this blessed hope, that's our word, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. One thing, way we look at this is blessed hope and glorious appearing are two different things. The blessed hope is the rapture, the glorious appearing is Jesus coming in the clouds. That's, this slide here, it, it looks very simple. This took me hours to figure out. I realized as I did this that I am not good with PowerPoint. So just appreciate this slide for me, please. Uh, so the, the, we're in what we call the church age. That's what we believe. Uh, began at Pentecost, Acts 2, and Revelation chapter 2 through 3 kind of encapture the church age. The church age ends with rapture, and then we believe that the seven-year tribulation, um, it's, I always tended to believe that the rapture happens and immediately it's the seven years. There's people that debate that. Uh, I think it's unimportant. I'm not going to be here for it, so I don't, it doesn't matter to me when the tribulation happens. So you guys can figure that out. Uh, Matthew 24, 21, the great tribulation. That's the seventh week of Daniel. The church at this point is in heaven, John 14, 1 through 3. And we're at the marriage supper of, of the Lamb. After the seven-year tribulation, Jesus comes. That's what we call the glorious appearing. And the thousand-year millennial kingdom reigns. Jesus physically reign, rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Uh, those who are martyred will rule with him, Revelation 24. Satan is sealed away during that time, Revelation 21 through 2. So there's often a lot of confusion about rapture and the second coming of Christ. They're two different events. And here's some and just a few of the differences. The rapture of Christ comes for his own in the air. We meet him in the air. The glorious appearing, Christ comes with his own to earth. The rapture, there's absolutely no signs. There's nothing that has to happen for the rapture to happen. There's no, we're not waiting for a prophecy. We're not waiting for anything to be fulfilled. It can happen at any time. And as we read through the New Testament, you'll quickly see that they're waiting for it. They're looking for it. In 1 Thessalonians, he, he talks about it. In 2 Thessalonians, he tells them they have to work or they shouldn't eat because they're standing outside staring up at the sky waiting for the rapture to come. Like, no, you still have to work and, and do things. Stop, you know, you still have to live life. But yes, he's coming at any time. Uh, on uh, the rapture, only Christ's own will see him. Uh, the glorious appearing or the second coming, every eye will see him. The rapture, the tribulation begins. Uh, the millennial reign of Christ begins with the glorious appearing. It's a time of joy, the rapture, and the glorious appearing. It's a time of mourning as he comes to earth. It could occur at any moment. Again, the rapture, the glorious appearing, again, second return of Christ. It cannot occur until the end of the seven-year tribulation. It's very clear. So these are just a few. There's many others. Again, that book that I mentioned at the beginning, that, that's where I got most of this. It's, it's important to understand. Uh, why we believe the rapture of the church takes place before the Great Tribulation. So there's different views of the rapture. There's uh, pre-tribulation rapture. That's what we believe. There's mid-tribulation rapture, where they believe at the three-and-a-half-year mark uh, that they're raptured. And then there's post-tribulation, where they believe at the end of the seven years tribulation, that's when the rapture takes place. That makes no sense to me. You're going up to come straight back down. That's, that's kind of weird. Uh, so we're not subject to wrath, wrath there in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 5 through 9. Matthew and Luke both talk about it. It's interesting that they're both the same verse. Um, again, the ecclesia in Romans, that's, that's the term used for the church. It means the gathering or the people, um, is not used after chapters 1 through 3. Very interesting. So the first three chapters, we, we read all about the churches. After that, the church is not mentioned again until at the end of Revelation in 22.16. Um, there's a few Old Testament examples, and maybe they're a stretch, but I, I think they work. Enoch was raptured before the flood. Uh, Noah obviously went through the flood. Lot is a good example that the wrath couldn't come down till the righteous man was removed. And Lot is a great picture because Lot was living in a very unjust territory. He even was not the most righteous we see because he, he was right in Sodom and Gomorrah. But God wouldn't bring his wrath down until Lot was removed. So uh, Israel was spared from the plagues in Goshen, if you go through that. So that's kind of our eschatological, yeah, that word, view. Um, if you have any questions on that, you can open it up, and now we're going to start to get to the real meat of it. Wonderful. So our first topic is Gog and Magog. I put this first because there's no, um, we don't know exactly when this is going to take place, but it is something that has not happened 
Yeah, it's in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, the term Gog there, just so you understand what that is, that is a title like Caesar, President, or Pharaoh. Uh, it, was, it was a lord. That's the idea. My, Magog is the region. Um, it says in Ezekiel 38, you see there, that the invasion will occur in the latter years or latter days. Um, the invasion will be in the mountains of Israel, Ezekiel 38, 7 through 9. So that's where this is taking place. There's always the debate, even within the Calvaries, when this takes place. Some think right before the rapture, some think right after the rapture. Um, I've gone back and forth. Some think kind of during the rapture. And the reason we think this is because after this is done, the Lord stops this invasion miraculously. He ends it, and it says all of Israel will know the, know the Lord. So it seems like Israel would all get saved. In my mind, that seems to be an after-rapture thing, because I, just my thoughts and, and progression, but the 144,000 will come out of Israel, remember, at the end days, and 144,000 Billy Grahams are going to go around the world preaching the gospel. To me, that makes more sense, because they're Jewish, that it's after-rapture. But again, I, I'm, not, I'm not hard and fast on that rule. So these are the, the ancient names compared with the modern names of these countries. Um, don't make me read these names. Uh, I'll read a few. Rosh is Russia. And then we have Magog, which was Central Asia, the Islamic Southern Republics of the former Soviet Union with the population of 60 million Muslims. The territory could include modern Afghanistan. Uh, the next one, I'm not going to attempt those words. Uh, then we have Persia, Iran, uh, which is Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Libya is Libya. So those are the countries that are involved in the Magog invasion. So just to recap, the six allies will come together for this end-time invasion of Israel, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, Sudan, and the nations of Central Asia. Uh, Ezekiel 38, 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, Thus says the Lord on that day, when my people of Israel dwell safely, you will not know it. So it's coming at a time Israel doesn't see. They're dwelling in safety. They're dwelling in security. I don't think that can be today because Israel is not safe. They are not secure. There's a lot of nervousness around them. Um, so. Interesting, I don't have it on any slides. They just re-elected Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, he's important. He's very strong. He's very pro-Israel. The last one was a little bit more, I can't even remember his name anymore, slack. But Benjamin Netanyahu does not play games. If you fire one rocket at him, his return is 100 rockets. That's the way he looks at things. He does not mess around. So, um, yeah, that's interesting that he got re-elected. So I remember, I don't know if any of you know who Chuck Missler was. He was a guy, he used to work for the CIA, he did all kinds of things for the government, a uh, very big part of Calvary Chapels uh, with Chuck Smith and stuff. Uh, he loved End Times Prophecy. And every year, he would put out a DVD series, like seven points. And I remember I got the one in 2000, back when I was young, and watched it over and over again. And he kept saying, Turkey is the key for this invasion. Because he believed, and this is the year 2000, that Russia and Iran were going to team up, right? So Turkey was the key. That's what he said. Check that picture out. That's Putin. That's, I don't know their names, but that's Iran. And that's Turkey, all standing together, holding hands. This was very recent. Uh, I don't have the date on this one, but I think it, oh, there it is. Uh, July of this year, July of this year, standing together holding hands, saying, yay, here we are together. Um, interesting. <clears throat> Russia, I got this one from the Jerusalem Post. This was December 7th, so this was this past week. Russia stops using Iranian drones because of a Ukraine winter. And I, I put that up there because Russia is using Iranian drones. There's also, and again, I don't have this one. Uh, they're talking about sharing nuclear stuff now too. There's all kinds of craziness going on that. Um, Israel gives dozens of countries intel on Iran's arms transferring to Russia. So here's this collusion, this Russia, Iran, they're really tight now. What's also interesting, they're, they're talking to China, they're talking to South Korea, basically all the bad guys in the world are starting to team up, which is just a scary thing. Um, <clears throat> Russia said to threaten retaliation if Israel supplies defense aid to Ukraine. It's interesting as you go through these articles here. Our secret weapon, Ukraine, enlisting U.S. to push Israel into sending military aid. So see how it's playing out? Ukraine says, let's get Israel involved with us. 
Russia says, if you get Israel involved with us, I'm coming after you, Israel. Very, very interesting um, and a little bit scary. So Israel has no natural resources. They are a country the size of New Jersey. There's been really nothing except its holy land, right? We know that God has given Israel that land. So it's holy land until recently. They found 13 billion billion cubic meters of natural gas off Israel's shore. Israel's huge gas reserve found offshores in Hems Field, a second article page. Um, The reason this is important is because who controls the gas and the oil for Europe? It's Russia. So Israel is stepping on Russia's toes when they start to drill this. Uh, It was maybe four or five years ago Putin flew to Russia, landed there, met with, uh, we call him Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, met with Bibi, and then they had a bad meeting, whatever it was, and left, and it was when they first found these deposits. Putin wanted access to these deposits, and Netanyahu said no, because it would be a threat, again, for their uh, energy uh, export. So that's my end of Gog. Magog, any questions? My Magog, Gog, if I can speak. Nothing going once, going twice. Okay, so the rumors of war, pestilence, famine, immorality, it's kind of a broad section, but we get this from Matthew 24, 3 through 8, and um, <clears throat> right where you see the red beginning, I'll start over there, and you will hear of wars and rumors of war, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places, all of these are the beginning of sorrows. With the earthquakes, who remembers like eight, nine years ago when we had, we had an earthquake here and it broke the, it put a crack up uh, the Washington Monument. That was something that had never happened around here. So in various places, that's unique. I don't, I don't really, didn't touch on the earthquake part. Uh, so rumors of wars and wars. The China will increase pressure on Taiwan in the next two years rather than invade, says Pentagon official. Right, right. Right next to that, U.S. Navy chief warns China could invade Taiwan before 24. And of course, on Friday evening, I saw an article, a headline, China's gearing up. So war rumor, what's China going to do with Taiwan? They claim that that's theirs. Taiwan says, no, we're not theirs. Um, so there's this tension. And let's be honest, China is, is a scary uh, country that we would not, I don't think we'd want to mess with. <clears throat> The U.S. war claims 240,000 casualties. Uh, The first article, uh, Russia launches fresh wave of strikes targeting, I mean, we know know all the Ukraine stuff, freezing Ukrainians left out without electricity, without heating, without water uh, in major cities. Uh, So we we know what's going on in Ukraine, this war, this... uh, Putin thought this was going to be over in a month, you could tell. At the end of the month, he thought it was over, and then it kept going and kept going. And there is a push. We, we have been sending millions, hundreds of millions into Ukraine to help out. There's other countries beginning to do that, Putin. Uh, it's going to be very interesting what happens in the next uh, few months to see wh- how this all plays out. I'm not sure if Putin's going to get desperate, which is a scary thing, because he had a headline, again, I didn't get, grab this one, about uh, firing nuclear weapons, that he would not initiate it. But if you believe Putin, you're... That's a little bit ridiculous. Um, The Pentagon says U.S. would defend every inch of NATO territory after reports that Russian missiles killed two people in Poland. So NATO's gearing up. There's more talks of this. Um, I have all the way on the right, North Korea, what missiles does it have? They're celebrating all of these uh, different missiles they're coming up with. Um, And then the middle one says U.S. now on the ground in the Ukraine. It's kind of hard to back up yet, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we were there. This one's very interesting. I found this kind of late, but Hamas vows to liberate Jerusalem on the 31st birthday. In other words, we're going to blow it all up. We're going to take it back over. Um, Hamas is always threatening this, but it doesn't make it any less valid. Uh, And that, again, this was December 7th this week that they, they made a public statement. We are going to liberate Jerusalem. Uh, Matthew 24, 3 through 36 uh, says, But the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only knows. But as it was in the days of Noah were, so also the coming of son may be, coming of the Son of Man may be. For as the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Um, I don't know if you can see the headline. 
right there. It says world population hits 8 billion. If you read some of the earlier commentators, uh, not earlier, but commentators, um, they said they believe, a lot of them say that they believe the world population was right before the flood around 8 billion. And they tracked it by lifespans and all that. It was very scientific. So they believed it was about 8 billion. So it's interesting that we're at possibly at the same uh, level as back then with world population. Um, India, this, so this is super, super interesting. India is, India is responsible for 40% of the rice on the earth. They, they export that much rice. So they did this export ban because their last um, intake of rice was so down, they have this export ban going on now. That's going to hit the, the Southeast Asia, Asia area hard with, with food problems. Um, and then if you see on my second slide over here, the rice exports do to decline. So not only is there a band and they're like charging more for their rice, they're not putting out as much rice. When we were in Cambodia, I laughed. We one, I don't remember what, which we went four times. I don't remember which one, but we made them spaghetti the one night. And we laughed because they're, you know, spaghetti noodles. Noodles is, is a little more rare in Cambodia. And they started taking rice and piling it in the spaghetti because rice goes with everything. You always eat rice. So it was just funny and it's a, Rice is important to that part of the world. Um, and then the other thing is, is Russia, I, I, I'll get to it, I'm getting ahead of myself. US NATO condemned Russia on grain deals. So there's this grain deal with Russia. We get a lot of stuff from Russia. We get a lot of our fertilizer, um, a, a lot of things are imported. And then you see the second one up there, Kremlin accused weaponizing food in the whole of Ukraine grain deal. Uh, it's a disaster, in Cal this is in California, drought dramatically shrinking California farmland, costing $1.7 billion. Um, this is important, too, because of the next slide that says National Black Farmers, uh, President Biden admin hasn't done anything on China buying up farms. So China has bought up, I, I wish I had it, but they bought, I think it was like several hundred million acres of land throughout the country in every state. I thought I had, maybe I have it somewhere later. Uh, but like Georgia, Georgia won't sell to them. And they're not doing anything with it. They just buy this land, this farmland, and they're not doing anything. And it's also interesting, I think I have it too, but uh, Bill Gates is doing the same thing. He's buying up land all across the U.S. and farmland and just not doing anything with it. The reason, again, this is important, this is famine, and this is designed famine. This is Bill Gates is a globalist, and he thinks, I have quotes from him later, that we should be under a global organization. He said some scary things. Um, this is the global food crisis uh, webpage. I took their, a cut. As many as 828 people to go hungry every night. The number of those facing acute food insecurity has soared from 135 million to 345 million since 2019. That's how drastic the food. Um, uh, and then it says 49 people in 49 countries teetering on the edge of famine. Uh, immorality, and when we bring up immorality, we got to bring up abortion. I got these from my I got a lot of these slides from my pastor, but this one especially, uh, worldwide, 42.3 million abortions in one year equals approximately 1,015 per day. 48,000 abortions per hour are being done. Um, even with Roe versus Wade, if you looked again, I don't have it. They were talking about trying to. Uh, federal government was talking about the states that ban abortion, giving free transportation to women that want to an abortion with flights and buses and whatever else to get them to a state that does permit it. So our federal government, our tax dollars going to support that. <clears throat> uh, this NPR blatantly denies unborn child humanity to justify live abortion broadcast. Apparently on this broadcast, it was a live broadcast of an abortion happened. The woman starts to cry, stop. And they don't stop. So she had an abortion um, on the air. Republican lawmakers seek to block no DOD policy extending abortions to travel expenses. That's what I was just talking about. That's the going from state to state. Um, we're murdering children. Um, and the scripture says, such as the kingdom of heaven. That's, it's the children. Um, here's some very just bizarre. This stuff blows my mind. Biological male wins local Miss America pageant. So a transgender guy goes up for a local pageant and he wins. I am so confused. 
Uh, LGB candidate, candidates have the historic night and rainbow wave. Remember, it was going to be the big, this big red wave, and Republicans were supposed to take over this midterm election. Well, the LGBTQ candidates are calling it a rainbow wave. Um, this, this one's interesting here, and maybe you don't catch it. it this article done by, um, I want to say the Washington Post or the New York Times, one of those two. Uh, I have it at the top. I can't even read it. But instead of calling them pregnant women, through the whole article, it's pregnant people. They took the gender out of it and called them pregnant people. The last one, this is rising. Texas teacher faces termination after telling students to call pedophile MAPS. MAPS means minor attracted person. They're trying to take away the pedophile term because they believe that's offensive and replace it with MAP, minor attracted person, and there's a push, I mean, there's a big push to get that attached to LGBTQ. That's what, that's what the goal is, and they are, they are pushing really hard to do that. I know that I'm glad this teacher is facing termination for that. Um, this is getting very perverse very fast, and I remember years ago when gay marriage was coming up, a guy, one guy told me this is only the beginning, because if, the reason gay marriage getting legalized as important, it's legitimizing that lifestyle. And if we can get that legitimized, then what's next? We don't even talk about gay marriage much anymore. It's just become accepted. It's just, it's just the way the nation is. Um, but now it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a cat, whatever you choose to want to identify as. So, um, and they're coming for our kids. Uh, the new Disney one, and this really bums me out because I watched the trailer and thought it looked neat. Uh, not at all secret gay agenda. Disney goes LGBTQ again with gay teen romance and the major new animation that's coming out. Uh, if your kids have Disney, please, please make sure uh, you're filtering that. I'm going to take but one side note with that. Um, if you allow your kids to have access without any limitations to the Internet, to me, that's worse than giving them several hundred dollars and helping them walk down Vegas Strip because that's what's out there. It, it, it needs, parents need to be monitoring this stuff. One thing I wanted to put up here, and I didn't, and I'm upset with myself for not doing it, I, forgot, I just totally forgot, was the pornography statistics, especially within the church. It's men, it's like 80% of men in the church are watching pornography, and now it's 51% of the women on a regular basis. I'm not talking, this is a once occurrence, I'm talking a regular basis. Um, there was a, a Bible college, and they were trying to get a church was trying to get people from them um, to come, young men, and they're like, well, we want these young men because we have a pornography problem in the church. So they surveyed all the young men at this Bible college to see who they could get to come, but they wanted to make sure they didn't have a porn problem. They couldn't get a single boy, not a single boy from a Bible college to come that didn't have a pornography problem that routinely watched pornography. Um, so that is an infection in our church, and it needs dealt with. Um, and then the, the statistically, if you, if you watch pornography on a regular basis, uh, all the other stuff gets numbed down, right? You don't have a problem with same-sex marriage. You don't have a problem with LGBTQ. All that stuff gets numbed down. And as we see, 71% of Americans support legal same-sex marriages. And just this past week, it might have been the end of last week, uh, the Respect for Marriage Act passes. So now the, our federal government respects marriage. Anything on that stuff anybody wants to add before we get on to our next topic, which is one world government? Going once, going twice. Okay. I'm just going to read the red parts. You see, it's, that's a lot to read, Revelation 1 through 8. And I saw the beast rising out of the sea, and he had seven horns and ten, or seven heads and ten horns, and on his crown, his horns, ten crowns. Skip down to the next red part. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped. So there's this one world antichrist is going to rise up. He's going to rise up after we're gone. We're raptured. We're not here. We shouldn't be looking toward the antichrist. We should be looking toward Jesus Christ. But it's interesting. I didn't end this. I don't have a person I point to because there's so many. There's a lot right now. So I'm not, I don't have anybody. If you have something, when we get to the end of this, if you have a person, uh, I know a lot of people talk about, I think it's the King of Jordan or the Prime Minister of Jordan, whatever his title is. Um, he's a very interesting character. He's worth looking into, but um, a lot of stuff. World Government Sud Summit. This was very recent. This was this year. This was uh, August of this year. Are we ready for a new world order? Um, and there's a couple quotes right at the top. You see Biden said, a new world order, and we've got to lead it. On the bottom, that's a Biden quote too. Capitalism 
as we know it, is dead. Uh, in the middle of that, all that text there, John Kerry, who is Biden's uh, climate czar, said this. Uh, I'll, I'll read the middle of this. Kerry, who has since been appointed, uh, everything I just said, Biden's climate czar said rejoining of the Paris Climate Accords by Biden would help drive the Great Reset by rejoining Paris is not enough, Kerry said. In the bottom, the Biden administration will focus on every sector of the American economy. He said there will be a 2035 goal to achieve net neutrality with respect of power and production. So basically, what they're saying is let's equal out everybody. We want equal, right? That, that's what we, we want the world to be equal. We want a worldwide social system. And what this new, uh, the great reset, I'm, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist too much sometimes. But on this, but they want to reset everything. Let's get rid of all the debt. We're one world, one nation, open borders for everybody, and everybody makes the same amount of money. What does that sound like? Communism, right? There will be one world government that's absolutely in charge, and Biden wants to lead the way, and John Kerry want to lead the way. Um, in the highlighted text down here, it's, there's a book called God and the World to Come. The Pope wrote that. The Pope wrote this book. And this is what he says. And this is... Here, we can read it. He opposes the right to poverty to property for individuals contending a social purpose and common good must come from sharing the earth's resources. And if that isn't disturbing enough, so this to me is the most, now this is the Pope, right? This is supposed to be the vicar of Christ. This is, so he is supposed to represent Christ on earth. We don't believe that, but that's what he thinks he is. <clears throat> on the bottom there, and just listen to this. The path to humanity's salvation passes through the creation of a new model of development, which unquestionably focuses on coexistence among peoples in harmony with creation. So salvation is let's all just get along and be nice to each other and treat the environment good. That's salvation. And that is the Pope. <clears throat> Uh, so this is the G20 summit that happened this year. Um, it's a bunch of nations that get together. This is the, the population that they control worldwide. You see from the population to the world trade to the world economy, wor uh, world carbon emissions they put up there. So this is, and you can see the map above, these are all the people that are part of this G20. That's important because why they met. It's time for universal connectivity and to digitize small enterprise. What he's basically saying here is we got to get to a point where everybody's digital and electronic. We want everybody to be electronic to be monitored so they're taxed properly so we can pay attention to what they're doing. That's basically what they're saying. Let's get all small businesses, let's get everybody, and they actually have uh, what we would call here, Biden calls them czars. They have czars now appointed that are trying, going out throughout the world to try to get everybody on one digital framework. Interesting. Uh, Bill Gates said, and, and the, the bottom of this is in yellow, he's a huge supporter of all this stuff. If there were such a thing as a world government, we would be better prepared to fight disease outbreaks. When COVID came out, and I couldn't find the article, but when COVID came out, he was talking about how we should probably think about chipping people, which is interesting in itself, because then they would have a register of their COVID vaccine, and we would have all that stuff in them. Um, and it would be right in, the, in their body. Bill Gates called out by farmers. Yeah, I, I did that. Buying up farmland. I don't want him to control a single acre, it says in that first one. And yeah, here's what I was trying to say earlier. Um, he bought 200,000 of acres in 18 states but Georgia. Uh, Georgia won't let him. And um, this next over here, this is from the Vatican. Ooh, it goes off the screen. Uh, it, and I'm just going to read, read the highlighted parts. A gradual balanced transfer of a part of each nation's powers to a world authority is what they're talking about. A new world with the creation of a world public authority. That's what the Vatican put out this, I think this was this year that they put this out. This is their statement. We need to, we need to get a center of power, especially after um, COVID, and get a world public system going. So one world order. <clears throat> Any thing on one world government, antichrist, anybody? Anyone? Once? Twice? All right. One world religion, apostasy. Another beast coming up out of the earth in the red. Causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. And then, 
1 Timothy, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience, and seared with a hot iron. 2 Peter 3.3, 3, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Uh, and then over in 2 Timothy 3-5, through 5, that in the last time, perilous times will come. Um, I'm going to read that whole thing because I sent this to a friend the other day. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boaster, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, uh, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. <clears throat> so one world, religion and apostasy, I kind of tied these two, two together. Uh, Jeff Bezos gave away $124 million to charities fighting against climate change. So I have a bunch of stuff on climate change because the new world order is what I'm saying is, is a two-part world order. And, and you'll see it. It gets really creepy. Um, climate change is going to be the, the god. That's going to be the idol um, that they're worshiping. And uh, I think I can make a pretty solid case for that. And the other one is going to be the LGBTQ movement, right? Being tolerant of everybody and accepting everybody. Uh, so you see the next slide, multi-faith leaders to gather in Israel around the world for climate response. To the right, you see the Ten Commandments of uh, climate change. Uh, this is an interesting one. Biden agrees to play climate reparation, but the world's biggest polluter, China, won't have to pay. Uh, further in this article, it talked about how for, for uh, pollution um, reparations, he's already given around $400 billion across the world for basically apology money, sorry that we create pollution. So there's, there's, there's their tithe, right? Let us give to this, this tithe. Uh, the Pope came out with 10 commandments of climate change. Uh, so on the bottom here, I hope you can see this. And I'm so mad at myself because I didn't get the picture. Religious leaders gather at Sinai, climate justice, 10 commandments. There was this procession, and I'm so mad I didn't get the picture, of the, the major religions of the world walking in a line to Sinai like they're going to get the Ten Commandments. Like you had, you had like the Pope was in the front and, and some cardinals, and then you had Buddhist monks, and then you had uh, Jewish leadership and, and down through Islamic people all going to Sinai to get the Ten Commandments of climate change. It was creepy. Um, and then you see the next slide. Uh, unveiled Ten Principles of Climate Repentance Call Humanity to Action. So they're using this biblical terminology, come to repentance. I read this article and all through it, we need to repent of this. We need to give money to this. We need to, and, and it's, it's a religion. It's all over again. <clears throat> so this is very interesting too. Abrahamic house in Abu Dhabi opens in 2022. So in the, yeah, your left, you see this picture of the construction. This is what it's going to be. This is a synagogue and I don't know if it's in this order, this is a mosque, and this is a Christian cathedral. So that's, that's what they're working toward, one world religion. This is in Abu Dhabi. It's, the Pope has already been there. He's blessed it. Islamic leaders have already been there. Uh, Jewish priests have been there, and they're blessing this whole thing. Yay, we're all coming together. And they're calling it Chris, Chrislam, I think they're calling it. Uh, so that's what's going on here. Uh, this is what I mentioned in the sermon today, in the, 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 your left side. 60% uh, of U.S. born-again Christians under 40 say salvation can be received through Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad. And I sent this to a friend, and he says, boy, do we have our work cut out for us. It has never been more dark. Uh, I'm not going to ask if anybody watches The View, because that's just, I can't ask. I don't want to know if you do. Uh, but this View host claimed Jesus would play a major role in the LGBTQ parade. He, in fact, it said, she said, Jesus would be the Grand Marshal at the Pride Parade. That's what she's saying. That's what Jesus stands for. So again, they want to use Jesus. They want to, they want to um, add him so they can have some sort of, sort of authority looking over it. Any questions when we're all religion apostasy? And once, one twice. All right, so we are on one currency, Mark of the Beast. We're, doing, we're going past it. Uh, and then the red there, it says, to serve a mark on the right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark, the name of the beast. The number of his name here is wisdom. Let him who understands 
uh, calculate the number of the beast, where does the number of man, his number is 666. With that, I want to say that when people start getting all upset when they see the implants and, and all those things, and, and I think we should be, I think we should be cautious. But when you get the mark of the beast, you know what you're getting. You know that it's the mark of the beast. You know who it represents and who you're worshiping it. It's not just a, a chip that they want to implant, though it could be. I'm not saying it's not, but it's not just... People, I've seen way so many Christians get so excited because of tattoos or implants. Well, I, I think that's part of it, and I have some of that, but I don't think that's what it is. You understand exactly what you're getting and what you're doing. It is the same as being sealed. He's, it's a mock of being sealed by the Holy Spirit. So when we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, we know we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is a mock to that. It's an anti instead of that. This is a, a mark to worship the beast. So um, you guys have probably heard of Bitcoin, right? Everybody heard of Bitcoin? If you have it, you're doing pretty good, right? Now, I remember when I looked at it a long, long time ago, it was like not even $1,000. And I didn't understand it. I'm like, how can this thing be worth money? I don't understand. What? There's nothing behind it. No government, no nothing. It's just very bizarre. But this is all the green that you see is all the places in the world that accept Bitcoin. <clears throat> and other, I mean, other cryptocurrencies, but mainly, mainly Bitcoin. So there's a, I'm not saying Bitcoin is, is the one monetary system or the mark of the beast. I'm just saying it's something like, it's, it's a precursor uh, type of thing. Everybody's coming out with digital currency. And, and if you track it, there's, there's good investment that can be made if you're wise. I'm not wise in that area. I'm not going to touch it. Um, but you can make a lot of money. It's, it's used everywhere. People buy cars with Bitcoins now and everything else. I think last time I looked, maybe somebody will correct me, it was like $64,000 for a Bitcoin right now. Um, something like that. So it's accepted anywhere. There's no government behind it. It's very, to me, it's always very odd. I really don't get it. Uh, but this could be a type of one world currency that's coming. Um, on top of that, we pretty much have one world currency. I went to England and I used my Visa card. I never had to use cash the whole time I was there. When you guys were in Portugal, did you guys just use credit cards? Probably most. No, you're probably smarter than me and got cash. But um, you can go anywhere. So if you're looking for the best credit cards, I found them for you. Here's all the best credit cards for international travel. If you want some of those, you can go there. There's some with no annual fees and all this and that. One World Monetary System is pretty much here. It's already pretty much uh, uh, we, can, we can do it. Um, again, the first one's Apple Pay. You can go to your how many people just pay with their phones when you go get groceries now. It's pretty much here. Um, G20 leaders agree to global vaccination and a passport system, so they're, they want to track when you move, if, you're, if, if you've got your vaccine and all this and that, um, they want to know what you're doing. Again, I believe this is kind of a precursor to this kind of things. States rolling out digital identity cards promise user privacy. Yeah, right. Um, you, want, you want a good test, go talk about, pick a topic. My, my buddy and I did this. Talk about like boats or something else, and just in text or email. And then watch how you start getting all those advertisements, right? For whatever thing you're talking about. They're, I don't want to sound this, but they're watching. Um, but microchipping your dog has been around forever. This has been out a long time. It's been out for years and years now. And I took the, the picture there. You see, that's the tip of his finger. That little thing there, that's how small it is. So the technology is here for the implant. If that's the way it's going to go, I'm not saying this is the way it's going to go. But that, it's here. Um, the one world currency, I think, is already here. Uh, we're really, we're just waiting for the beast. We have the mark. We're just waiting for him to step forward and lay claim to it. That's my distorted opinion. Um, anything for that? We're, we're wrapping it up. Okay. Israel in the third temple. I love this part. This is very interesting to me. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 24, I'll read the red. Abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads it lets him understand. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What Jesus is talking about there is that um, the temple has to be rebuilt because the Antichrist at the three and a half year mark is going to walk in and he's going to make a sacrifice and proclaim himself to be God. So the temple has to be built for that to happen. There is no temple in Jerusalem right now, so that would have to be a precursor. I listened to Jack Hibbs this week and he was talking about, I love the analogy he used and I'm totally stealing it. He said, if someone tells you that right before the yellow bus comes, you're going to get picked. I'm going to pick you up in my red Corvette. When you see the red bus out in the distance, you know the red Corvette's about to come get you. 
This is what's going to take place during the seven-year tribulation. We just went through that we're pre-tribulation, so we believe Jesus is coming. We see the yellow bus coming, which means the red Corvette's just about here. Um, again, in Daniel 9.27, but in the middle of the week, that's the three-and-a-half-year mark for the tribulation, uh, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. That's talking about the Antichrist. So there's this place in Israel called the Temple Institute. They are very, very passionate about getting the temple up and going, but they have had some problems because they didn't have everything that they needed. <clears throat> so you see here, it says, first pure olive oil produced in 2,000 years. They needed this olive oil. Guess what? It's being produced now. In fact, they can't keep up with it. Uh, they're producing it. Down on the bottom is just what the temple should look like. Uh, the other thing they need is they need a red heifer. Guess what a United States farmer did? He sent them three red heifers in the middle of this year. That just happened. Um, they have to be inspected. They can't ever work. Uh, like they, you know, The priests are going to come out the, and go through every hair. He can't have one hair, but they, they sent him up to hair. That's in Numbers 19. Uh, I put the time on September 15th to this year at 5 p.m. Uh, the red heifers arrived from the USA. Um, <clears throat> so they needed this red heifer. The red heifer is needed, um, and I'll explain with the next slide. Uh, there's this other dye uh, that was needed for the priest's robes. They have not that now. They haven't had that. But this crimson worm dye, this was the last straw. This was the thing they needed. Um, I mean, they were still waiting for the, the red heifers too. But they had this crimson dye they, they didn't have for the longest time. They thought this was extinct. They thought there was no way to get it. Well, guess what? They found the worm, and they're extracting the dye. And then if you see uh, the scripture I have at the bottom, the cow in this is the red heifer. So the cow shall be burned in the sight of its hide. Flesh and blood shall be burned. It during and included the, the coat, coat, I don't know the word, shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson stuff, that's this dye, and throw them into fire, consuming them with the cow. That is the way to dedicate the temple. They needed this red dye, and they needed the red heifers. Well, they have both. So all they need now is an, a way to get there. And um, this was I-24. That's a newish, new, uh, a Jewish um, news channel. And I can't even read the headlines of my stuff. But uh, it was a bunch of, like, if you type in Temple Mount, this is all the stuff that came up. And basically they're saying they're ready. Everything is prefabbed. Everything is designed. Most of it, it's, they said they could have it up in less than two years. It's very interesting. They could have the whole temple up in two years. It's prefabbed, ready to go. They're training the priests. They've been training the priests for a year. They have this dye. They have the red heifer. Um, they're ready to go. But the interesting thing is the control of the temple mount. And this took me some digging because I, I never understood this, and I still don't know if I do. So when Israel got their land back, they, immediately, they went into the Six-Day War. They fought, they, they beat everybody back, an amazing story. Um, and then they came back and they gave the control of the Temple Mount away. And to this day, it makes no sense, except it was God's timing, right? So the person that controls the Temple Mount is basically uh, in Jordan. And it's, it's, the word is W-A-Q-F. I, I don't know how to say that. The Jor and it's, it's these blends of people that control the, mountain, the Temple Mount. Nobody can do anything on the Temple Mount without the permission of these people. So Israel does not control the Temple Mount. They control the security on the Temple Mount, but they don't control the Temple Mount. So they're waiting for the day that they can get control back of the Temple Mount to rebuild their temple, and they're ready to go. They, they, they just need the word. There was a quote a long time ago from uh, a Jewish rabbi that said, we would worship Satan if we could get the Temple back. Um, so they just want their temple. They just want this practice uh, on on this website too, on the um, Temple Mount. Wrong way. <clears throat> the the Temple Institute. If you want to go and look at it, they have an interview where they went through the street and they were talking to people in Israel about the Temple Mount, and everybody was saying, "I'm not really religious, but I want to see the Temple Mount up there because it will bring peace." And I'm like, "Who are you listening to? The whole world will go in a war over this temple." But all the people kind of had the same mentality. We want our temple back because it's part of our tradition, part of our, and it meant nothing religiously. It meant absolutely nothing. It was just part of their tradition, and they want to see it back up there. So uh, that was it. And I wanted to end it with hope because a lot of people look at these things and they get all downcast and discouraged. 
And no, God is in absolute control. None of these things are, are out of his hand. Um, and I put Deuteronomy 31.6, and, and it's requoted in the Gospels, but uh, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord, your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Again, kind of go along with our message today, that he will be what you need. He's, he's the one that's satisfied. He's not going to leave. He's not going to forsake us in this time. And in fact, he says in Thessalonians, I'm going to read this this time, for this we say to you by word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive remain shall be caught up and together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, that this is a comfort, that this is, uh, we're going home soon. <laughs> and then Jesus ends the Bible. Uh, this is the second to last verse in the Bible, Revelation twenty two twenty. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Thank goodness he's coming quickly because it's, it, it feels like it can't get much worse. I'm sure it can, um, but it feels like it can't get too much worse. So that's it. You want to cut off the live stream and if anybody has comments, questions, or um, concerns or whatever they have.